Well, last week we started a series in the book of Colossians, and uh, we're talking about identify yourself. Who does God say that you are? The Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Colossians, addresses this uh, to us. And today I want to talk to you about what Paul wrote about living a Jesus first life. Now, we can live Jesus first, or we can live me first. You know what I'm talking about? If you're a parent, you know what that's like. Uh, You've probably, if your kids are old enough, have taken your kids to McDonald's and buy a Happy Meal. You say, why would you do that? Because of McDonald's French fries. They're awesome. And uh, I remember our kids, we have three kids, Brittany, our oldest, very mild-mannered and laid-back, Brandon, the most loving of our kids, and Brooke, our youngest, she was kind of feisty. And I can remember with Brooke, we would uh, get her a Happy Meal, and I would always reach over and sample some fries, you know, because they were my fries. I bought them. And uh, whenever I would do that, she would try to smack my hand and say, no, those are mine. They're not yours. Now, what she didn't seem to understand was that those were actually my fries. I'm the one that bought them. She didn't, she didn't have a job. She didn't have any money. She didn't have the ability to pay for them. So I, they were technically my fries because I bought them for her and I gave them to her. And, and also what she didn't realize was that I had the ability to give her more fries than she could possibly ever eat. She did not understand the concept at that young age of not living me first. When you and I live a Jesus first life, we're just like a child that gets that happy meal. And when we freely share what God gives to us, we're living a Jesus first life, not a me first life. Well, the Apostle Paul talks to us about this in the passage we're going to read today. And he talks about it in this way. He talks about the preeminence of Christ. Now, when something is preeminent, it's foremost. It's first. It's got first priority in your life. So when we talk about living a Jesus first life, that's what we're talking about. So begin reading with me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, he, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. That's interesting. God created the heavens and the earth. What was he saying? He's saying, I'm God. Paul was saying, Jesus is God. He said, uh, anything on heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's one reason why I don't get too bothered by what's going on in the political world. You say, do you not vote? No, I absolutely vote. I don't think you got a right to complain about things if you don't vote, and I like to complain about the government a lot, a lot you know. Maybe you're like I am. But the truth is, It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who controls the Congress. God is the one that's in control. That's what he's saying here. In the end, does it matter that you vote? Yes, but just understand this. God is the one that's in control. God has all authority. And in the end, he's going to work it all out. It says, and before him is all things, and in him all things hold together. So he's in control. He's preeminent. He's also not just over this creation as creator, not just over all principalities and thrones and dominions and everything. God's in control. But he's also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. You get the idea that God wants Jesus to be first in your life? That's what he's saying. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things. You know what that means? 
that one day when Jesus comes again, when King Jesus begins to rule, that everything in this world will be reconciled. Everything in this world will be put to order. Everything, every injustice will be made right. Everything that you think is wrong in this world will be made right. And you can just rest in knowing that Jesus will be the greatest leader of all. He will be Lord of all. And whether we acknowledge him now or not is up to us. But the Bible does say this, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You may be a person that says, well, I don't believe in God. You will. You will. You may be a person that says, well, I don't believe that Jesus is the way. You will. The Bible says that every person will bow the knee in reverence. The point is, don't wait until it's too late for you. Don't wait until it's too late. Let Jesus have preeminence in your life now. And, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. That just simply means that he saves you. He changes you. Doesn't matter what your past is like, when it's under the blood of Jesus Christ, all is well. All is well. And it says, uh, in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which had been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Well, there's a whole lot in those verses, but let me just give you some thoughts and we'll wrap it up here. What does it mean to live the Jesus first life? What does it mean to give Christ preeminence in your life? Well, first of all, you gotta submit to his authority as the Christ. You say, wait a minute, shouldn't you say his authority as Christ? No, the Christ because of what that word means. Uh, that comes from the Greek word Christos and it means the anointed one. Jesus was anointed by God to be our Savior. Jesus was anointed by God to be the one that reconciles us to the Father. He's anointed. He is the Savior of the world. He's the Christ. We've got to submit to his authority as that. The Hebrew uh, for that is Yeshua Hamashiach. Everybody say Yeshua. Yeshua. Say Hamashiach. Hamashiach. Uh, some of you thought I was speaking in tongues right there, okay? But that's just Hebrew. And here's what it means. Yeshua HaMashiach means Jesus, the Messiah. That's what it means. Jesus is our Savior. We've got to submit to him as God, as the authority. Why? Well, because he's God. By the way, you've got notes there that you can write down. Uh, some of you probably didn't know what that was, but we, during the summer, we're handing out these notes so you can take notes and write, uh, write things down. So we submit to his authority. Why? Because he's God. He is the image of the invisible God. We have no other option than to submit to his authority. If we're gonna be pleasing to him, if we're gonna live the kind of life that is a Jesus first life, we submit to him because he's God. We submit to him because he has all authority and must be first in our daily lives. It says he is the beginning, that in everything he might be preeminent. Why does God say that? Because he wants to be first in every part of your life. Um, I always love the principle of firsts that we find in the Bible. Uh, God wants you to give him first in your week. I really do believe that success begins on Sunday. 
I believe you can get more done in six days than you can seven. When you put God first, you say, well, I have to work seven days a week. I realize sometimes there are, um, there are extenuating circumstances. But just trust me when I say you can get more done in six days than you can seven. Why? When you give God his day, it allows you to rest and it puts Jesus first in your time. The Bible talks about meeting the Lord early, praying early. God wants to be first in your day. Now, does the Bible say that um, it's a sin not to pray or read the Bible early in the morning? No, it does not. Okay, so some of you are like, it, you're not aware that the sun comes up gradually. Every time you wake up, it's light outside. And then there are others of you that uh, you can't hardly sleep past four in the morning. You have to get up and start doing stuff. And you get more done by 10 a.m. than most people do all day. But then you go to sleep about four o'clock in the afternoon, all right? Um, so it doesn't matter what your schedule is actually like or what your body requires if you're an early riser or if you are late riser doesn't really matter God wants to be first he wants to be first in your daily lives he wants to be first in your finances he wants to be first in your marriage he wants to be first in your parenting he wants to be first you see when I put God first with my children I bring them to church I let them learn about Jesus through my example I don't just sit them down and preach to them, but I see God, that I let them see God in me. And, and, and that makes all the difference. And then we need to submit to his authority as the Christ because he's the savior. He's the one who saves. He says, we make peace by the blood of his cross. That's beautiful. Jesus died for you. If you're not a follower of Jesus, know that he loves you. And know that he died for you. Here's the second thing. You got to surrender to him as the creator. He's the Christ. And he's the creator. You say, well, why is that important? Well, when you understand that God is the creator and we are the creation or the creature, then it changes everything. The more I acknowledge him as creator, the more I acknowledge that I am responsible to answer to him. The more I understand that he's going to hold me accountable. And the good news about that is simple. When God holds you accountable, when you trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, when you allow the grace of God to be poured out on you because you believe in his finished work, you're not trying to earn your way to heaven. You don't go to heaven by uh, joining a church uh, or even getting baptized. You can get baptized in every baptistry in this county and still not go to heaven. You see, going to heaven and being made right with God is an act of faith. It's an act of trusting him as your savior. He is the savior. He wants to be first in your life. And he says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible and I want you to understand that what the Apostle Paul is saying here is number one, he has authority in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm. We see that from the life of Christ when he was here on this earth. He had authority in the spiritual realm. He had all power over demons and Satan himself. He has all power over any of the spiritual warfare that goes on in your life ultimately, they all will answer to him. Ultimately, the devil and all of his demons will be judged by Jesus Christ. He has authority in the spiritual realm. He has authority to save you. He has the authority to keep you. But he also has authority in the physical realm. What does that mean? Well, he has all power. We see in his life in the gospels, as it was recorded for us, he had all power over sickness. He had all power over disease. He had all power over death. Jesus has all power. We see in the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, what Jesus had power over was he had power over finances. There were people that needed money and uh, he provided it. He uh, told Peter, 
uh, to go cast a hook. Peter was a fisherman. He said, go cast a hook and you're going to catch a fish and it's going to have a coin in its mouth to pay your taxes and mine. He's got all power over the physical realm. He has all power over sickness and disease and death. We constantly see that he healed blind people, deaf people, people that were crippled with some kind of disease or paralysis. And not only that, every disease that was known to man at that time, he had the power over and also he had the power to bring people back to life. I want you to understand this about Jesus. He didn't come to get you to turn over a new leaf. He came to bring dead things to life. And that's what Jesus does for us. We've got to surrender to him and follow him as the Christ, yes. But he's also our savior. And so um, we need to serve him. Number three, serve him as Lord in the church. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about a Jesus first life. You submit to his authority as Christ. You surrender to him as the creator. And then you serve him as Lord in the church. Paul talks about this in this passage that we read. We are to see that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And it tells us that through him, he reconciles to himself all things, whether on earth or heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we're to serve him as Lord in the church. I want you to see this. A preeminent Christ. What do I mean by that? Putting Jesus first. We always want to lift Jesus here at this church. We, we don't want to lift ourselves. We don't want to lift a person other than the person of Christ. We, I mean, yes, there are going to be some people that are going to be on stage more than others. There are going to be some people that lead and, and have authority. But understand, our preeminence here in this church is to be Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And when we do that, a preeminent Christ brings peace and harmony in the church. You see, the more we raise Christ, the more peace we're going to have. The more uh, unity that we're going to have in the church. Now, I've pastored two churches as senior pastor. This church and the first church I pastored was also in Georgia. And I was 31 years old when I became the senior pastor of that church. Now, I was full of vim and vinegar and uh, man, I was raring to go. My wheels were spinning by the time I got into that church. We got some people here that were in that church. They know what I'm talking about. Man, I hit the ground running and man, you know, I didn't ask permission. I just told people to follow me. I didn't really have a clue where I was going, but I knew we were going to do something good, right? And um, because I moved a little bit fast, I did some things that caught, it was a traditional church, um, not like our church, uh, not contemporary in any way. Everything about it looked very, very traditional, but I was going to, you know, make some changes. And so one of the first things that I did, we had this gigantic pulpit. You ever been to a church that's got that gigantic pulpit? I mean, it looks like you could live in that thing, all right? And uh, it was huge, and I didn't want that because I wanted to walk around a little bit. And so I got rid of that gigantic pulpit and I got a, a stand about this size, but it was made out of plexiglass. Oh my goodness, you would have thought that I had committed some kind of heresy in the church because I made some changes, all right? And another thing that I did, and this was even worse, um, I removed the communion table from the front. Now, I didn't do it because I was trying to be a jerk. I just did it because we needed the space and we, we were remodeling and re getting a new look. And I was so excited about it. But man, you would have thought that I turned the church into a nightclub. I'm not kidding. There was a guy one day that uh, came up to me and he was giving me a piece of his mind about all these changes that I had made. And I don't know, it just seemed like God gave me this as a gift. Uh, because I looked over into the back seat of his car and he had a, a, a shirt from Hooters and uh, wings from Hooters, all right? And uh, I called his name. I won't call his name. He's like, you know, hey, you shouldn't do this in the church. You shouldn't do that in the church. And I looked at him. I said, hey, I bet they don't mind down at Hooters. Do you? 
And he just said, oh, shut up. And he got in his car and laughed, all right? Now, what am I saying? I'm saying when you look at a person, when you look at a program, when you look at a style, hey, our music style, our style of church, there's nothing uh, sacred about the style. What we do is we want to worship Jesus. We want to reach people, okay? We could have a choir and choir robes, and that can be glorifying to God. We can have uh, more, you know, we used to have a little bit more 80s rock and roll type of music, you know, than we do now. We can have modern worship. It doesn't matter. The point is you lift up Jesus Christ. That's what you do. And when you lift up Jesus, all this other stuff, don't make a mistake of criticizing other churches that are preaching the gospel just because they don't have the same style we do. And then don't come to this church and complain about the style that we have because we're trying to worship Jesus and make him preeminent. That brings peace and harmony in the church. Uh, Look at what he said. And once you were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds and he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. What does that mean? Well, a preeminent Christ brings life change to the church. I have my doubts about people that say that they're a Christian, but there's no change in their life. How can someone as big as God come into your life and not change you? And I'm not talking about traditions, and I'm not talking about following, you know, some list of silly rules. I grew up in a church that had silly rules. Men couldn't have hair over their ears or on their collar. Women, get ready for this, it was a sin for you to wear pants in that church. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Uh, It was okay, because I grew up in North Carolina, it was okay to smoke on the front steps of the church because, you know, we all had tobacco up there. Uh, And you could be 14 years old and stand on the front uh, steps of the church and smoke. And and that was okay. But you couldn't go to the skating rink because, bless God, that was the devil's music down there, you know. Uh, You couldn't go to a movie. You couldn't go. You see, I'm not talking about some list of silly rules. That's not what God has called you to. He has called you to a relationship with him. He has called you to live in his grace and allow the goodness of God to change you. But trust me, when you begin to learn about the goodness and the grace of God, it will transform you. There will be life change. And then finally, a preeminent Christ brings a love for evangelism in the church. He says, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. God tells us that our hope is in him. Our hope is in the gospel. And what you and I need to do as believers, we need to lift up Jesus, make him preeminent in our life, live the Jesus first life, not the me first life. And when we do, we live life with an open hand. Whatever is in your hand, when you do this, God can't put anything else in that closed hand. A lot of people think, oh, this is mine, just like the illustration I gave at the beginning. The me first life, you know what it does? It it holds on to its French fries. Doesn't share. Doesn't share with the source. Why? Because they're afraid that they have a poverty mentality, that there's never going to be enough. And everything in their life, it's mine, it's my time, it's my life, it's my talent. It, it, it's my money, and we, we close our fists. But oh, when we live life like this, it makes all the difference in the world. You see, God can continually fill a hand that's open for him. Live the Jesus first life, not the me first life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. Help us always to lift up Jesus Help us to put you first in all that we do. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.